Gordon. Welcome to the Development by David podcast. I can't believe I'm actually saying this. Seth, how are you, my friend? I'm well. I can believe you're saying it. Your name's David. It should be what you say. If you said my name was Chuck, it would be weird. <laughs> I was thinking about it, Seth. <laughs> I'm going to read out your bio for the listener's sake. For the four or five people who don't know who you are and haven't shared this excitement with me. So Seth, you're a best-selling author of over 20 best-selling books translated into nearly 40 languages. These books include Lynchpin, Purple Cow, Tribes, Permission, Permission Marketing, The Zip and The Practice. You've been inducted into the Marketing Hall of Fame. You have some of the most prolific TED Talks and lectures online, including How to Get Ideas to Spread and Stop Stealing Dreams. You're the creator of the All MBA, which I graduated from this January. What a life-changing moment for me. You say you're a teacher, you do projects, and that you simply notice things for a living. And you write a blog every single day over in Seth's blog. What an absolute bio, my friend. Does it still amaze? Does it ever amaze you to hear that back every time you do this? Do you ever sit with that feeling of the recognition of the accomplishments that you've achieved? Like, I would need to take time to sit with that if that was me. If I heard <laughs> that every single time. Um, well, first, thanks for having me. I would say that that is a list of things that are easy to say to a stranger, but they aren't the hardest things that I've done, and I am. So privileged, such a head start, so lucky, um, and I look forward to doing the hard work every day. And yes, it's sort of amazing that someone who was as rejected as I was early on, um, and who took a little while to get up to speed, to look at that long list. Um, but there are still things that don't work, and I'm proud of those too. I love that, Seth. I am almost certain that podcast guests have asked you so many varied questions and I don't begin to believe that I will cover something that hasn't been asked before. When we were exchanging emails, I gained the sense that your style or your jam when you come onto podcasts is about giving the listeners their own revelations. I think you give someone a revelation by asking great and open questions. I've heard you say, you open the sale, don't close the sale. That being said, how do you continue to have daily revelations on your blog, despite being asked every flavour of question? Can the everyday Joe blogs have um, revelations every single day? Well, you know, if it's new to you, it's a revelation, right? And uh, I don't think you can give people a revelation, but maybe you could establish the conditions where they can find something out on their own. And they, I read a sh uh, science fiction short story when I was 12 years old about a time traveler who goes back in time and gives Isaac Newton a calculator. Because in his view, what a great way to supercharge one of the great thinkers of all time. Well, Newton, it turns out, was a deeply s superstitious person. And he looked at the glowing red numerals on the calculator and decided it was the work of Satan and he smashed it against the wall. So if someone's not ready, if they're not open to see what is possible, they're just not going to do it. And my job isn't to write the, bl the best blog post every day. It's just to publish the best blog post I have. And so I write three or four usually for every one that people see. And I look at it again the night before just to be sure it's the one I want to publish. And half of them are still below average. And that's part of the beauty of blogging every day is you don't have to ever hit a home run. I've never, ever had one blog post that won the internet. And that's great. That's my goal. Just show up and turn on some lights. I love that. And I love that thesis. I am a huge fan of your blog. And that's why I left it as a last tagline to introduce you. And I introduced you by signaling to the audience um, that haven't been introduced to your work. By sharing all of the accolades and the milestones, the books, the talks, the Hall of Fame inductions. And I know you wouldn't want that and I know I know you don't need social proof and you don't want that. But given you've had such a momentous and esteemed prolific career, laced with all these unbelievable accolades, Seth, I want to ask this question. Within all the interactions that you have, do people love you for who you are 
or what you do. And in a similar vein, should listeners focus on being useful for what they do or liked for who they are? So, you know, people listen to this podcast and they've never met you. And there is an expectation they have of who you are, but they don't know you. Um, You know, Jerry Garcia did thousands of concerts and the only person who heard every one of them was him. Um, And so I know we're not on video here, but here's my little Jerry Garcia action figure. I think I know Jerry Garcia, but of course I don't. All I know is this little shred of who I want him to be. And I am under no illusions that people who read my work know me because they don't. But if there is something from my work that is helping them get to where they want to go, that's why I'm here. One thing that I loved hearing you speak about is why we should aim to be useful, not entirely authentic. What did you mean by that? Well, okay. So this really rubs people the wrong way. So I'm thrilled to talk about it. (laughs) Uh, Authenticity is way overrated on the internet. Authenticity is being whoever you feel like in the moment. And most of us, if we're adults, stop being authentic when we were three years old. You know, we have a job to do, so we put on our clothes and go to work, even if we don't feel like it. That if you um, fracture your wrist and a surgeon's fixing it, you don't want the surgeon to be authentic. You want her to be the best surgeon in the world, even if she doesn't feel like it. And what we really want from people is consistency. We want them to meet and exceed our expectations, not be a diva. And there are a few people on the internet who are making a living being a diva, spouting whatever pops into their head. But... I just don't think that's a role that's useful for many people, and it's overrated. That's so powerful, Seth. I'm computing that as we speak. They say never meet your heroes, Seth. It's one of the most cliched statements, but you're one of mine. I was actually introduced to you as a young disadvantaged teen when I looked online and found the Gary Vaynerchuk uh, episode with you. And I guess a lot of your younger listeners probably have found you through that similar vein. And why this podcast was so momentous for me was because you sparked in me as a young disadvantaged man a sense of thinking differently. To stop being too careful, uh, which is one of the biggest tropes of my demographic, I learned from you how to explore the edges and why I should explore the edges. I learned about my boundaries that were self-imposed by my inner beliefs. My inner beliefs, I believe, shaped my narrative But you in my ears at the age of 17, I wanted to learn learn to become a proprietor and a curator and a creator of generous work. I wanted to see what I could achieve and put out there if I found out what was beyond my boundaries. You became a digital role model for me. Someone that guided me yet didn't know that I existed. It's what I try and recreate with this podcast, digital role modelling a legacy directory. So I've heard you speak about heroes versus mentors. Why should we spend more time finding a hero and forgetting about a mentor? Okay, so first, that was very kind of you. Um, I think I may need to disagree with one thing you said, which is uh, you're not achieving success because you're going outside self-imposed boundaries. You're achieving success because you've chosen to be generous. And those are different things that it's easy to get sold on hustle and selfishness when we say, I have to get past my boundaries. But if we decide to, do, to be of service and to be generous, then it's much more likely to work. And my rant about heroes and mentors is simple. Mentoring doesn't scale, and it's sort of a myth that someone who ostensibly has more influence or power than you is going to stop what they're doing, truly understand you, and coach you forward whenever you need them. That's really unlikely, and it certainly doesn't scale. The alternative is to have it be that that person never knows that they're mentoring you because you're asking yourself, what would they do? And that idea of, I understand the representation this person has brought to the world. All right, if they were here, if the Mahatma was here, what would he tell me to do? And that scales because they can be with you whenever you need them. I would never have believed that I'd be sitting in front of one of my heroes, Seth. Can I ask you, who's been your heroes over time? Well, you know, I grew up 
really lucky with amazing parents. And along the way, I've gotten to meet and work with many of the people who I quote in my work, people like Zig, people like uh, Jay Levinson, people like uh, Stephen Pressfield and Roz Zander and Ben Zander and Tim Wu and Cory Doctorow and um, Debbie Millman, uh, Sarah Jones. I could talk about all of those people. The thing that I want to remind people of is if you do what I did, you're not going to get what I got. And that's the way it works. I mean, we're talking about culture, and culture is really, really complicated. That's why it's not useful to know what I had for breakfast. Because you could eat what I ate for breakfast, and it's not going to make any difference. I feel like generous work is almost shipping work into existence that already doesn't exist. And I mean, I, I've been on today already, and if the listeners have not already unpicked this, I have a great sense of imposter syndrome sitting across from you, Seth. You, I've heard you speak about how imposter syndrome can be weaponized almost and is a great thing and can be a positive thing, whereas we see it as something that's paralyzing and something to be ashamed of. How can we weaponize our imposter syndrome and why is it positive? Well, I'm not sure I want to use the word weaponize, but let me, let me try to, to riff on this a little bit. Um, if you are doing something that you've never done before, if you are leading, if you are inventing, if you are making art, well, then, of course, you're an imposter because you have no proof, right? If you're working on the assembly line and putting the 19th widget into the 19th box, you're not an imposter. You're doing a cog work, and I get that. But if you feel like an imposter, that is your good psyche telling you that you might be onto something. And when it shows up, don't fight it. Don't pretend it's not there. Say thank you. Thanks for letting me know that I'm leaning forward into possibility. And so when, when imposter syndrome shows up, say thank you. And that almost kind of eliminates your last point where I shouldn't be having the same breath, uh, the same breakfast as Seth Godin or the same lunch as any of my other heroes. I should be creating my own recipe. I love it. One thing that I've been cautious of is, and it's because I have so many different facets of my identity, is that I become good a lot, at a lot of things, but not great at particularly anything. Mm -hmm. I loved reading in your book, The Dip, um, about being paranoid about mediocrity. Why is perfectionism and mediocrity almost the same thing? And uh, similarly in The Dip, you spoke about why I should aim to be the best at something. What, what do they all have in common? Perfectionism, mediocrity, and being the best at something. Okay. So many great questions wrapped up into one here. Let's start with this. Perfectionism has nothing to do with being perfect. Um, quality is not a measure of expense. Quality is a measure of meeting spec. If you meet spec, then you're done. You don't need to make it better than spec, because if the spec was set correctly, meeting spec is the point. Perfectionism says, I can always find something to improve. If that's true, that means you will never ship it because you are holding back saying, I can always find something to improve. We're not looking for perfect. There is no perfect. And we certainly don't want your perfectionism. What we want is your generous utility. We want you to figure out what the spec is, meet it, ship it, make things better, and go on to the next thing. The second thing you talked about was mediocrity. Mediocrity is another word for average. Now, if you are pretty good at a lot of things, that means you're average at a lot of things. On the other hand, if you are pretty good at just about everything, that in itself is a skill. And that's what a handyman is for, right? That if I am looking for a generalist, and you truly are a generalist, you are a full stack software developer, with graphic design skills and the ability to use uh, online resources to find uh, contributors, that in itself, that breadth, is something you can be great at. But most people are neither great at breadth nor do they have depth because they're afraid. And so they decide to be average, and their motto is, you can pick anyone, and I'm anyone. And we don't need that. We need you to be able to say, there's only one David, and that's me. And I do things that other people cannot do. And either you want that or you don't. If you don't want that, I totally understand. Here's a phone number of five other people who aren't me who can help you. But if you want this skill, which you cannot get from anybody else, that's what I have. 
Can we confuse mediocrity and incompetence? And when should we know when to quit? Okay, two more questions. Incompetence means that the thing you said you were good at, you're not good at. That doesn't mean that you're the best in the world at it. It just means that you can't do the thing you said you were going to do. An incompetent bus driver gets into a traffic accident because that's not what they promised when they got on the bus. We don't need you to be the perfect bus driver. We don't need you to be the fastest bus driver. But being a competent bus driver means you can keep your promise. And um, the second half of your question just leaked out of my brain. What was the second half of your question? When should we know when to stick and when to quit? I left this chapter out of the book on purpose because I want people to understand that that's the hard part. I want them to ask themselves the question. So my friend Annie Duke has a new book coming out about quitting. It's really good. And part, she used to be the world champion of poker. And poker is a game largely about quitting. The way you win at poker is by folding. Not every hand, but the right hands. And her argument is, you know you're quitting properly when you find yourself sometimes quitting too soon and never quitting too late. Because if you quit too late, you lose everything. If you're a mountain climber and you quit too late, you don't get to climb another mountain. And so what I'm arguing about the dip is you need to see it. Has anyone ever been through it before? Has anyone ever gotten from where you are to where you want to go? If no one ever has, it's possible you could, but unlikely. Better to find paths that have known dips in them. Prepare for them before you get there. When they show up, welcome them, say thank you, and go through them. And that's what medical school is. And that's what it is to um, mindfully climb Mount Everest. That if you're trying to climb a mountain that's never been climbed before, you might be a fool. But if you're trying to climb Mount Everest, please understand that 200 feet from the top, there's a dip. What about sunk costs, Seth? What are they and how important are to consider a whole half hour course on this on LinkedIn that I encourage people to check out. Sunk cost is a huge mistake that many people, including me, make, which is we say to ourselves, Well, I invested a lot to get to this situation, right? So I better live with it, as opposed to saying, Every day I get to make a new decision with new information. So here's a, a super simple example let's say um, you're going out of town for a few days and uh, you only have one more night at home and you're going to cook dinner out of what's in the icebox. In the icebox are two things. Some fish that was really expensive that is sort of past its prime and some spaghetti sauce which you really feel like eating. Which should you have for dinner? Because whichever one you don't have, you have to throw out. And there are a lot of people who say, well, I better eat the fish because it was really expensive. That's silly. Right, Because you already bought the fish. Whether you eat it or not, you're still not getting the money back. So make a new decision based on new information, which is there are two items here. I got them both for free. I have spaghetti sauce for free or old fish for free. Which one do I want? And making decisions without regard for how much it costs us to get here is a rational way forward. Seth, I accredit my new way of decision making entirely to you and your old MBA course. I learned that throughout my life I've categorized processes with bad outcomes as bad decisions. Are they the same thing? This is another great Annie Duke riff. Um, if you see something that doesn't work, it's easy to blame the coach or the president or the prime minister who led to it for making a bad decision. They're completely unrelated. A decision is made with the data that's on hand in the moment. An outcome is something that happened across a range of odds. And if it led to a bad outcome, it might have been the right decision. And we shouldn't judge our future decisions based on one piece of data. Okay. I'm not sure I persuaded you with that one. So, um, friend of the family drove from 
one part of New York to another by going over a bridge. And while she was going over the bridge, there was a traffic accident and she was injured. And her response was, I'm not driving over bridges anymore. That's silly. The traffic accident didn't happen because she made a bad decision about bridge or no bridge. It happened for other reasons. Every time you get in a car, there is a chance you're going to get in a traffic accident. Don't use a vivid piece of data that was a bad outcome to change the way you evaluate the range of choices you have tomorrow. Because we know that 9,999 times you drive over a bridge, you don't get in an accident. So the fact that you got in an accident doesn't say anything about your decision-making ability, bridge or no bridge. It says you got unlucky one day. And yet, we fire soccer football coaches for this. We turn over governments for this. Instead of saying, outcomes go in a range. And just because there's one shiny outcome that really sucked or it was really amazing doesn't mean the person made a good or bad decision. It's just another piece of data. Right? There's one thing that goes on with investors, which is that they tend to look at the past performance of a fund before they put new money into it. But their past performance isn't a reflection of whether they made good decisions in the past. It's a reflection of whether they had good outcomes in the past. And we know there's not a lot of correlation between the two in that single instance. And so what we need to do instead is develop the rigor to be able to look at what is open to us when we make a decision and not get clouded by outcomes. I'm bought and sold, clear as day now, Seth, thank you. How integral and important is design thinking when making decisions? Are they married at all? Design thinking is who's it for and what's it for? Who am I seeking to change? What change am I seeking to make? So if your decision is, I have five things I can do for a living and the outcome I desire is to make a lot of money, then you say, well, let's explore what each of the five of them do. Who are they seeking to serve? What change are they making? And what are the range of outcomes each one has? in the marketplace, and then I can make an adequate selection based on what I said I wanted. If I am choosing between you know, three designs for a wireless mouse, well, who's going to use the wireless mouse? What are they going to use it for? How do they decide to buy a wireless mouse? Once I understand who's it for and what's it for, I can make a smarter decision. I love it. One of the standout practices that I learned from you was the habit of shipping generous work often and with intent, Seth. Your book The Practice says creativity is a skill, not a talent. It can be learned. And I posted that on my story on Instagram a few months ago and it was met with vitriol. Um, some of my friends didn't believe in it. Um, how can you practice creativity? I thought it was something that it was innate. Apparently, it's an action, not a feeling. Uh, okay, well, vitriol is certainly not helpful. Uh, there are so many ways that I can prove that this is true. I'll begin with this. When you were three or four years old, when your friends were three or four years old, did they ever once paint a painting that had never been painted before, build a sandcastle that had never been built before, tell a joke that had never been told before? I think the answer is yes. That if I ask a classroom of five-year-olds, how many of you are artists, almost everyone will raise their hand. If I ask a classroom 10 years later of 15-year-olds, almost no one will raise their hand. Did suddenly talent that they were born with disappear? I think that's unlikely, don't you? What happened was we were indoctrinated into being compliant cogs in an industrial system as opposed to choosing to put our work in the world. And, you know, I'm very clear in my head about the difference between talent and skill. So let's talk about uh, perfect pitch. Perfect pitch is the ability that some humans, musicians have, that if you play a note, they tell you what note it is. If you ask them to make a sound, they can make it in middle C. And it turns out that uh, many people think that this is 
a talent, that you are born with it. Either you have perfect pitch or you don't. If we look at kids who are born and raised in China, approximately 5% of them have perfect pitch. If we look at kids who are born in the UK, approximately 2% of them have perfect pitch. So we say, oh, proof, because genetically, clearly, it is running through lineages in China, but not in the United Kingdom. However, if I look at kids of Chinese descent who have Chinese parents who are born in the United Kingdom, they are 2% likely to have perfect pitch, not 5. It is not based on their genetics. It is based on the fact that Chinese is a language that is more sung than spoken, and you are more likely, because you were learning it as a little kid, to develop perfect pitch. So even something that it seems a talent, perfect pitch, is not. It's a skill. And we sell ourselves short if we think that being a comedian is a talent, if we think that being a leader, if we think that being an industrial designer, if we're born with those things, that's nonsense. Johnny Ive wasn't born with that. He put hard work into it and he learned it. One of my favorite quotes that I learned from you was the Elizabeth King quote, process saves us from the poverty of our own intentions. How can you avoid losing passion for what might seem like a habit or a hobby by almost brute forcing it into your life through a process? Yeah, I think passion's way overrated. I think that it, our work is too important to wait till we feel like it. And, you know, if you look at the people who are operating at the highest level, whether they are chefs or race car drivers or jugglers or people who run nonprofits, they show up at work on the days they don't feel like it. That's what it means to be a professional. And if you want to turn pro and you want to be proud of your work, don't wait for passion. You become passionate when you do the work, not the other way around. What do you think of creator's block then? So, so writer's block is just a myth. Writer's block was made up. We know who made it up. Um, and Percy Shelley did people an enormous disservice. He was insecure and he said, don't even try to be a poet. Because if the muse doesn't come, we're stuck. Only some people can be poets. And that led to, if you, if you do a, a search on Google Ngram, you'll see that writer's block didn't appear commonly in the literature until the 1930s and 40s, less than 100 years ago it was invented. Because if the stakes are high and you think you have to be perfect, the easiest thing to do is say, I don't have any good ideas. And I say, well, show me your bad ideas. Because if you show me enough bad ideas, I am betting a good one will slip through. You have written hundreds of blogs every single day that is your creative outlet that's how you are generous to the world and that's okay because you are Seth and people from the outside end will think well that's fine because Seth is a writer but they might think I'm not a writer I am not Seth why is my voice worthy for the world why should the everyday Joe blogs or why should I write well first just to speak for myself the first year that I was writing my blog, I had a hundred readers. And when I was in high school, my English teacher wrote in my yearbook that I was the bane of her existence and I was never going to amount to anything. Um, I have no degree in writing in college. I took exactly one English class. I, I just write like I talk and I got better at talking. So th that, I, that excuse is not really useful. But you should write a blog even if no one reads it. I would write my blog if no one read it. Because writing my blog first and foremost clarifies my thinking, puts me on the hook. What a gift for free to be able to, to keep a record of what you see, what you believe, what change you want to make. And if other people read it, that's great. Similarly, I have a process that I complete every single morning where I write down my thoughts, my actionable thoughts and my non-actionable thoughts. And I have done that every single day for two or three years now and I have an audit trail of every single idea I've ever had and sometimes I lean on them Seth sometimes I go back yeah. on them and use them again sure. and without having that process I would never have been able to um, create creative endeavors that I've went on to do yeah no I mean that's brilliant and I'm thrilled you're doing it. 
Thanks, Seth. What is wrong with post-industrial revolution schooling? Why why did you create the Alt MBA and how does that rival what we've been taught in school? Okay, so I don't run it anymore. I'm super proud of what I built and the team that runs it now. Uh, it's a B Corp and uh, I encourage people to check it out. But this all started when I did a rant called Stop Stealing Dreams about how school was broken. Because school is still training people to go to work in a factory. And uh, not far from where you're located, a guy named Josiah Wedgwood invented the modern factory uh, in the 1600s, and he was making pottery. And if you're making pottery on an assembly line, you need people who will follow your exact instructions. And Josiah Wedgwood made so much money doing that. He was the richest person in Europe. And his grandson used some of that money to finance his voyages, and that's why we have heard of Charles Darwin. That's unrelated to what I was talking about, though. The thing is, almost everything in the Wedgwood factory that matters is made by a robot now. We don't need people to do exactly what they are told. The people who are doing exactly what they are told aren't well respected, nor are they fairly compensated. We need people who decide what to do next, who solve interesting problems, who learn how to see the world as a question, not an answer. And we're not doing nearly enough to teach people to do that. One of my favorite areas that I hear you speak on is building the smallest viable audience. Surely you would like to build the biggest viable audience. Why, why, why should we focus our efforts on that? So the key word is viable, which is how many is enough? If you are going to open a hotel, the smallest viable audience is not five people. You'll go out of business. But if you open a hotel, you can't have a million guests. You have no room. You want exactly the right number of guests who are there for the right reason, who will talk about you, who will pay on time, who won't trash their room, who blah, 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 blah. Well, once you figure out what that number is, make it just for them and ignore everybody else. One of the problems with the internet is infinity. That we say, well, my Twitter is not good enough because not everyone on Twitter reads what I write. Well, if you try to get everyone on Twitter to read what you write, you will write nothing. So instead, be specific and say, I want to put this hook into the world and I'm on this hook. And if this doesn't work, it's my fault. But be very clear about what it is as opposed to saying, as I said before, you can pick anyone and I'm anyone. That doesn't work. <laughs> oh, fantastic, Seth. I noticed that you have no comments on your blog. Even your smallest viable audience don't have an, a direct chance to interact with the work that you put out there. Was that deliberate? Well, those are, you just said two different things. The people who read my blog have a lot of chances to interact with what I put out there. They just can't do it in my front yard. That they can take everything I write and comment on it in lots of other places. They can turn it into their own writing. They can have all sorts of conversations. That's what the internet's actually for. I just realized early on when I did have comments on my blog that they were breaking my heart, they were confusing me, and they were causing me to make my writing worse because I was answering my critics before I even posted. Because I was saying, oh, someone will misunderstand this sentence. I better explain it better. And it just got averager and averager and averager. And so I had a choice. I could have a blog with no comments or I could have no blog. And I figured people would rather have a blog with no comments. A personal question for you, Seth. Given that you have had direct and indirect touch points with thousands of lives, how does that make you feel on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you wake up with a great sense of gratitude or does sometimes, does that feel overwhelming at all? I think I feel a responsibility. I feel like um, if no one knew who I was, I could probably act more, quote, authentically because no one knows who I am. But I have chosen this path of acting consistently because people trust me. And earning the benefit of the doubt is priceless, and I don't want to waste it. I've heard you say that you treat people's attention with kindness. When people have the wonderful opportunity to interact with you, most specifically on, um, in person, when they may 
act overwhelmingly touchy feely or intrusive. How do you how, how do you deal with that? I'm trying not to do that almost virtually, Seth. How, how do you treat people's um, attention with kindness when they overstep the mark in real life? Well, I'm awfully lucky that I don't really have that problem. I think that people understand that I'm a person too. Um, what I meant by that expression is, you know, I'll get a note saying, I love your podcast. I love all of it. Can I be your next guest? And I'm like, which episodes have you listened to that had a guest? Because there are 250 episodes I've never had a guest. No, you're just spamming a list. You just stole from me. You stole my peace of mind. You stole my benefit of the doubt. You stole my time. That's not kindness. And what I'm trying to do is talk to people in a way I'd like to be talked to. And I think if we can all do that for each other, it makes things work a lot better. Seth, you have created a generation of ideas. And I mentioned your bio and your accolades and your achievements today. If you could go back to younger Seth and provide him with like a universal lesson as a mentor or a hero, what would you like to tell him? I think I would just remind myself that everything's going to be okay. If I gave myself advice that would have changed the path of my life, I would have had fewer failures. But the failures are part of the deal, and then I wouldn't be where I am right this minute. And uh, that's true for everybody. No matter what we deal with, if we define whatever happens as that's what happened, then we're right. And so instead of wishing for a different path, let's figure out how to make the path we're on something we can be more proud of. Can I ask, who do you do it for? Over 20 books. <laughs> Your legacy cemented into existence forever. Who do you do it for? You know, I meet new people. I see what people who have been following my work for a while do. I'm aware that Leverage is precious, and that's what I'm doing it for. There's this microphone that you have and that I have, and let's not misuse it. So I am guilty of not working nearly hard enough for the people who have given me the benefit of the doubt, but I persist. And none of it's perfect, but we try to make it better. And you do this every single day. I need to ask the question, how does Seth Godin rest? What do you do for fun, <laughs> Seth? Come on. <laughs> yeah, this is fun. I, this, it's all good. It's all fun. I'm going to have to, to wrap up, but it's been such a delight to talk to you, David. I really appreciate these questions, and I really appreciate the way that you are leaning into leadership. So thank you. Thank you for opening the sale for me, Seth. This has been a whirlwind of an episode, a real hallmark and anchor in my podcast history. I'll never forget it. I remember interacting with you virtually as a 17-year-old, and I can't believe I'm having this conversation. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. Thank you. Keep making a ruckus. We'll see you.